we have got to a point where actually we need to uh, invest in teacher development in a way that we haven't done before. That actually um, it's seen that if we can help teachers to achieve a level of mastery in five years, if they stay for five years in the profession, then they stay for the long term. Um, and that actually a key part of all that improvement is concentrating on improving lesson observation, something that's seen as, as quite negative for people at the moment. And again, that comes back to us with trying to get cameras in the classroom to, to look at that and make it a better place. Alison, or oh, sorry, Dame, uh, Professor Dame Alison Peacock said last week we need to, to build windows into classrooms and to encourage collaboration and the sharing of what happens into classrooms. Cameras in classrooms are, are not necessarily new and with uh, handhelds and iPads and portable cameras people are videoing more and more lessons. But there's still an issue there and I think the cropped out bit shows it quite well there that a decision has already been made on what to video in that classroom. And typically it's this kind of shot. The teacher at the front, what they're putting on the screen and what's happening around them. But actually it's not capturing the whole environment. So you're losing you know, what you may want to look at at that time or retrospectively. From these uh, initial findings and feedback from teachers, we've gone on to develop the lesson view solution. What does it comprise of? In the ceiling, we've got the 360-degree camera. Um, the diagram here shows it mostly in the middle of the room, but actually, typically, it's about a third of the way back from the front of a classroom, especially a secondary school classroom. Colleagues seem to find it very valuable to be able to look down and see what students are doing on the front row and their books and their reactions uh, to the teaching that's going on. A boundary microphone on the front wall, a studio-quality boundary microphone that picks up everything. And then the lesson view gateway. Sometimes IT in schools is not the easiest to work with. And so we wanted to innovate past that and created what's called the lesson view gateway, the metal box there on the left, which has everything in it to record the audio, record the video, store and then share the video forward, export it out as may be needed to um, the lesson view cloud, to the web. In working with the school, when we start to talk with them, immediately there are lots of questions, lots of concerns. The first two questions are typically, who's going to be able to access my videos by a member of staff? And what are they going to look for in those videos? So we've got into this area where we've got something we call the DNA for success our starting point with schools before cameras ever go into those schools. It's a really important part of this. Is uh, for senior leadership teams to take on board that this needs to all be about teacher ownership of the video and security of the video. Without that, people may as well not start this journey. In the schools that are thriving, that has been embraced and is embedded. And we're seeing it going further and further into those schools. All the ways on. Uh, when we started with the technology, we more or less had the cameras on in classrooms all of the time. And out of that came some real opportunities in that normalised teaching, day-to-day -day normalised teaching was captured. So that people could jump back and go, oh, you know, this morning that Q&A went really well, or actually I didn't do that so well. And the ability to jump back in. It wasn't recorded at a prescribed time. It was just being recorded, and they could jump back. Discreet, but not hidden. With all of the schools we've worked so, with so far, all of the staff are aware of the camera there, and so are the students. In a very short space of time, and I'm seeing some nods here from the front row, in a very short space of time, the camera's forgotten about, and we're on to the day-to-day -day fast teaching and all of this. So, um, we can all look at a video of ourselves and we typically kind of see what we probably want to see in our lessons. Uh, I think that was probably the case many moons ago when I used to look at some of my demonstrations that are recorded as a, a design and technology teacher. But a really significant part of the work that we've done with schools today and going forward will be about helping schools to uh, put in place pedagogy that helps them look at their, helps teachers look at their videos, um, be curious as to what's going on, and make the invisible visible. Thank you.
obviously a key thing sitting there listening actually from the, the back of the room um, and actually watching several people in the room tweeting out, uh, especially phenomenally about the research you've done. And for me, the point you really touched upon was that ability to go, actually, I've seen a lesson which was amazing, but I don't quite know why it was amazing. And I think that's that learning journey as a, as a trainee teacher coming through. I was very fortunate. My journey came through as what was called an advanced skills teacher in the early days, which I still think is one of the most powerful transformational tools within a school, which is actually teaching and learning changes a school. And obviously the work of Envy that we're doing, and I'm, we're starting that journey here at Aston University Engineering Academy with uh, three or four cameras initially, and obviously aiming for a whole school deployment. I'm absolutely delighted to have such experts and people have been through it uh, next to me. So I'm going to ask them a few questions and then going to throw it out to the floor. So please do get those brains and those juices flowing around what you really want to know from it and we'll throw them back to the relevant people on the panel. So Marge, we heard from you at the end, obviously quite a, a very poignant statement that you, know, you were one of those people who were considering whether teaching was still the right place for you. And obviously through the camera-based system you were able to start to explore why and your whole ethos around the pedagogy in your classroom. So can you share a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, I think... Is this working? I can't hear. Um, I think we'd been in a position where our school went into special measures back in 2013, and I was... I had just finished my NQT year in 2013. Um, and I got to the point where I was really excited about developing languages in a school where, for the decade previously, languages hadn't really been used that well but then all of a sudden I had to teach in quite a prescriptive way and it sort of took the fun out of it and the creativity um, and then I reached a point where I wasn't sure if that's the career path I really wanted to stay with um, and then I met with Sean and we had a few initial discussions and then it was later well earlier this year when we actually got the cameras into the classroom and all of a sudden I felt there was this freedom again to take those risks to try out those new activities, to really respond to what the students were saying and feeling and how they were reacting, and also to have that different lens. It was no longer about scrutiny of the lesson observation form and am I ticking the boxes, am I showing that I've got enough progress in books, am I doing all these things? It was more about are these students engaging with me every single day? Am I making all these minutes count? And some of it was not very nice to watch because it was going, oh, that really wasn't what I'd intended. But it was a learning experience rather than somebody saying, well, you're not doing your job right. It was, OK, what are we going to do about it? How can we change? And that was really enlightening. So I suppose that summary term you've used there is that self-reflection. So the cameras focused you more, do you felt you self-reflected more through the use of the camera system? Yeah, I think it's really, it's really harnessed what was already there inside i think everybody who is an effective teacher has to reflect to a certain point but it certainly gave a bit more it gave a different perspective and a bit more focus to that self-reflection thank you i'll jump over to claire on the end i'll stand back a bit of feedback um claire obviously how obviously yourself in the classroom what about colleagues around you what did they feel when they heard that you were being filmed or they're coming in the classroom you know what, what did that generate um is this on yeah um well <laughs> As Marge said, we, we went into special measures and so we were inundated with lesson observations. I don't mind them. I don't know any other profession where you are watched quite as much as teaching. I've been in two other professions and nowhere near the scrutiny that we have now. Um, I don't mind them, but none of my colleagues like them particularly. Most teachers don't. And they're so false. And so I thought, this is a bit annoying. I know you're coming. I overplan the lesson. I overplan it, I deliver it, and everything goes tickety-boo. And you think that didn't actually achieve anything. You are your own worst critic. Nobody will criticise you as much as you do. They will only see what they want to see. So colleagues within the department, we got pretty fed up of being observed. So when the camera came in, they thought, well, that's like 365 days a year observation. And I said, yeah, but by me. It's me who's observing me. Um, they, they were very um, surprised. We've now got two cameras in maths, so there's another classroom with a camera in. Very surprised that we'd gone with this. I don't think I'd like it. I wouldn't like to see myself. I don't like to see myself, but that's not the point. I want to see what the pupils see. And gradually, as all of us within the Academy have got cameras, talk about it more, relay the successes of what we see, 
then colleagues think, oh, okay, I might give it a go. Now, the only thing I would say about that is when we only had a, a couple of cameras, I swapped and used uh, Marge's room where the camera was. That's quite difficult. The classroom's not laid out like mine. It's not my classroom. The kids know it's not my class. Why are we in here, miss? We made up a little story of why we were in there. We didn't say because there's a camera watching you. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked. Um, so you're not in your normal environment. And in fact, for part of it, the kids were brilliant because oh, new room. we don't normally come in here. You know. So it's false again. The best results come when it's day to day. That lesson where you think, I winged that. I definitely winged it. And you can see Excuse it back me. there. Can, can your colleagues stop rustling? It's very distracting. Sorry okay. about that. That's okay. Um, but when you think you've got that lesson where you think, oh, that wasn't the best planned lesson. And in fact, you look it back and think, well, actually, there's elements of that that I should use again. Um, and just the more you talk about it, colleagues will start to realise that nobody else can see it. That's Thank the biggest fear. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, we've, all, we've, we've been there, and for those professions, uh, people, professionals in the room working in schools who are doing observations have all seen it. You know, that lesson you go down and think, actually, you know what, that was a fantastic lesson. And I really learned so much from it, the way you did it. But actually, yeah, you're absolutely right. You've touched on it. You know that colleague's worked for seven hours on that lesson. And I always leave as that leader thinking, actually, but do I really want to return for the next lesson in an hour's time? Because if they've spent seven hours on that lesson, where's the next lesson actually going to be going? And I think you're right. It's that word I use in the video, that totality of the teaching experience, that totality of the day, mostly the normal. And you touched upon another point then, which was really exciting, which was around sharing and sharing the information, starting to talk amongst colleagues. Dan, obviously, you heard about the primary school and those first stages. So how about that, about in terms of sharing and looking at working amongst other colleagues in the school? I think when we, we introduced this, there was that, that element of fear. And, and, you know, I remember when I launched this with the um, senior leadership team in, in Shavington, I got, oh, I don't want to see myself. I don't want to hear myself. And, and actually, it took somebody to stand up and say, do you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a go. And the reason she gave it a go was one, it, it was Rachel who you've, you've um, seen earlier on, but she's probably one of our most experienced teachers, one of our most reflective teachers. And for her to, to stand up and say, actually, I'm going to run some CPD for staff here where they can look at what I did, not in a prepared way, not in a way that, that I'm demonstrating, but actually where I'm going to show somebody where something that I did went a bit wrong. And then the professional dialogue around what went wrong so that they can actually all learn from that, that experience. Um, the one great example she, she gave, and I think some people around the room have seen it, was, was where a child had turned his pen into a pea shooter behind her back. And you know, she thought that the, the lesson had gone fantastically well, behaviour was, was absolutely superb, and, and um, I think, Sean, you, you saw that lesson, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, but actually, it was a fantastic learning moment. And, you know, what it did was show that not everybody's perfect. This is real life. This is day to day what goes on. Um, you know, I don't, as a school leader, want to go in to a school and see a performance. I've got no interest in seeing somebody put on a show. I'm interested in what the children, children do. You know, I've, I've done some remodeling work on, on the schools. and I actually put windows into the walls. Um, but what you tend to get is, is, is people put curtains across those windows in there so that that's a display so that you can't see in. And actually, all I'm interested in, what are the children doing and learning? So the, the camera here gives us a real bank of CPD opportunities and people sitting around talking, discussing learning, um, rather than how can they get a, a, you know, a one in a lesson observation. Fantastic. And Dr. Sean, to respond to that. Yeah, uh, we're, we're talking about Rachel. The, the, the power of working with Rachel, because she was so experienced and had this, say, this, deep, this deep tactic knowledge, was we were able to use the ingredients in the template for her to be able to deconstruct what it is she did and then to be able to articulate that so that she could then disseminate it to others. And, uh, and uh, she was a pleasure to work with. I think it's a key, a key point. You know, what we're talking about here, the fundamentals in some way, and we're here to launch, uh, obviously, in terms of the, the product, but actually the products in some way, and I'll get shot for this, is irrelevant. What we're talking about is, you know, CPL is actually driving the learning in the classroom. And we've all been, and through our journeys, I'm sure, have all been on that course where you, you know you've been released in today's climate to have the money and as a, you know, as a principal to actually allow a member of staff to go out. Normally it'll cost me £600. It'll cost me at least £120 in cover costs and the risk of who who's going to be teaching that class while they've gone. And they go away and of course you're, that, they're going to come back with that fantastic gem of learning. 
And actually, in fairness, on the vast majority of times, um, they come back and actually they haven't gained anything new, or it's been very, very short-lived, or more importantly, when they get back in the classroom, they haven't got time to disseminate that amongst their colleagues. And then you realise actually the expertise is actually within your school already, mm -hmm. and that ability to be able to see each other and what they're doing, um, and actually watch and share is so exciting. Okay, coming across then, okay, so David, obviously, you've got head of digital strategy, so you know the tech. So, you know, the challenges or more importantly, the advantages of using this type of camera equipment, please. Okay. Um, so, I've been doing IT in schools for over 20 years now. Uh, and I've come to the point where um, I don't like technology very much. Um, specifically, uh, I don't like technology uh, that doesn't work. I don't like technology that's too complicated. I don't like uh, technology that... Uh, <coughs> gets in the way. I don't like technology that doesn't deliver value for its investment. Um, so apart from that, <laughs> the thing about the, the thing about it's going to sound a little bit like I'm pitching and I'm, I'm genuinely not pitching. The thing about this uh, and the reason that I'm so happy to work with Andy, Andy I, I, Andy's and I have been working together for about half my career in schools. And so um, I, I'm interested in what he has to say because I know where he comes from in terms of an educational background and where his heart is, more specifically. Uh, for, my, for where my heart is, I've always said I, wanted to, I went into schools because I wanted to help children. Uh, I realised very quickly that you can help a lot more children by helping teachers. Um, and so I, my, I'm all about... My, my, what I'm trying to do here is, is it, within my career is, is help teachers and push things forward and help them to be better at what they do because that way you'll help the children underneath them. So specifically to this piece of hardware, I'm, I think I'm the only one who's had the latest version of this, uh, the latest version of the software, the latest version of the hardware. Um, as I, I think I, I mentioned on that snippet of video, what I love about it is the simplicity. Um, I, I wanted to set one of these boxes up uh, last week, a, ca a camera in a box last week. Uh, it took me from walking into the room to the system being plugged up, ready to go, um, it was about seven minutes. Uh, it was a very, very easy thing for me to, uh, to sort out uh, and, and get installed um, really, really quickly. So, and then on top of that, you've also got the actual software itself. Do go and look. If you've had a look at the screen that's sort of facing towards the classroom over there, do have a look at that, the, the, the software. I've had absolutely no training on that software, and I can already use it. Okay, yeah, I'm a technical person. I've been doing a lot of computers for a lot of years. But actually, it's really, really straightforward. So going back to my thing about hating technology, if I don't hate something, the chances are it's something that I can actually use in a classroom because my filter is set so high by years of tablets and laptops for every student and Wi-Fi and trolleys and all the other things and interactive panels and whiteboards and all, all this other stuff, all this tech that we've had in schools for the past 20 years coming and going, I've, I've set myself a really, really sort of high filter and, and this has made it through the filter. Um, and that's probably the best thing I can say about it, is that from a technical point of view and from a classroom and curriculum point of view, I think it's a good thing and I think it's, you know, I, I think it's something that will last and will carry on. You don't need me to talk about the quality of lesson observation and what's to be gained from that. I, I am a teacher, I've, I've observed my own lessons, I can tell you about that as well. But actually, from a technical point of view, from a trust point of view, from a what happens to the video, how do we share it, is it actually going to work on Monday morning when I get into my school point of view? That's why I'm sat on the chair at the moment, because I think it is. If I didn't think it was going to, I wouldn't be sat on the chair. Thank you. Um, we've, we've heard one really key phrase uh, discussed this morning, uh, and that's trust. You know, the trust of that member of staff to have their video. So I'm going to come back to Dr. Sean uh, in regards, you know, you, all those, you mentioned the hundreds of observations that you've done and you've seen. Why do we think that this product now and this time, the time of this launch, is so pertinent for the profession in terms of the staff wanting and being able to utilise that trust? Well, I can talk from a, from a personal perspective. When I go in there and I know I'm working with colleagues that are going to allow me into their classroom through video, um, I start from the assumption that they are competent human beings. They are competent professionals, uh, margin clear, they are the experts of their subject, of their groups, and all of those things. That's my starting place. And therefore, when I come in, I mean, uh, maths is a clear subject, yours is a foreign language, you know. <laughs> it allows me to genuinely be a learner. 
I'm in there and I am genuinely curious about what it is they are trying to do. What well, I know what their learning intentions are and as I'm observing, I'm just plotting away and I'm allowing thoughts to bubble up and I plot those thoughts. And that produces rich, rich data and then we have a conversation. And because we, we spend time together, because we are open with each other, we have open conversations now that, that are rich. And, and Marge is superb, she's a black belt. So if I explain something to her, she doesn't get it, she will tell me immediately. She, she could be my missus, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she tells me. Which means if I'm explaining something and Marge says she gets it, that the penny has dropped, then we know we're onto something. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. Uh, moving on, the last bit to margin. I suppose we've talked a lot about from a teaching perspective and from the teachers, but what about the learners themselves? How have you found that from both the students in the room knowing there's a camera there or maybe not even knowing uh, there's the camera there overtively? You know, how has it affected their progress? I think in the first instance, I had a lot of students who spent a lot of time pulling faces at the camera <laughs> and waving at it. Um, I did, I've been very transparent with the students um, the whole time and said, look, this is a piece of technology that I'm using and there's big signs on the door and in the wall and the, you know, on the wall in the classroom that say this is for professional development and this is... And I say to them, one of my expectations of them is I want them to be the best versions of themselves in every lesson. And my justification is I want to be the best version of myself for them in every lesson. And so they're actually really, at first, intrigued, but then they forget about it. And they have forgotten about it. It's been in my room for almost 12 months now. And I've got groups of students I've taught from year seven and they're now in year 11. And what I find very interesting is how I've changed the dynamics of the groups as a result of what I've seen. Mm -hmm. So I've got students, for instance, the group that Sean first started working with me. Um, I had students in that group who were very passive, not willing to engage. You know, I'd ask for feedback, do the sort of thumbs up, thumbs down, trying to get that initial in situ response from students and they would just go through the motions. And I could see from their books they weren't doing what I wanted, or it certainly wasn't visible that the learning was taking place. Whereas now, having looked at some of the student focus and actually plotting that baseline data, where is that student now, where do I need to get them to, and then looking at how I can change responses in lessons, those students are visibly making progress and the penny has dropped for them. And that is so rewarding because it's made all of this investment and the time spent looking at it really, really valuable. Fantastic. Um, you know, from our perspective as an inner city school in Birmingham, you know, 80% Muslim students, obviously one of the things we're working with is obviously how do you adapt and work with the students in terms of the understanding of parents don't want their child to be filmed. And again, we've actually approached that very effectively with parents, exactly the same conversation around developing learning. And so far, actually, parents have been really supportive, saying, absolutely, I understand why this is being used in the classroom context. And obviously, that security and the methodologies around the hardware and software that you mentioned actually reinforces <coughs> that position of what the tool is used for. So I'm going to hand it out now to the floor now. So what I'd ask is, obviously, for, for a perspective of being able to hear. If you've got a question, if you raise your hand, uh, we've got a microphone that's floating around and someone will bring it down to you. Just come down to the front row, please. If you want to direct it at a specific person, by all means, otherwise I'll allocate it out. If you want to say who you are, where you're from as well, just so we know. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm John Galloway. Uh, I spend a lot of time as advisory teacher for ICT and SEN in Tower Hamlets. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to pick up on the uh, question of students. Um, and, and two questions, really. One is uh, that students spend all their time in schools ob observing teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you ever find a role for students in providing feedback on your practice? I know um, Sean mentioned something, but yeah, something more formal. And secondly, whether you've used it for students to see their own behaviour and yeah, how that, how that works. Got a few heads nodding at that one, so I think they'll pick up. So um, if I take the first question to Marge, if that's okay, in terms of utilising feedback from students, then I'll come to Dan probably um, as well from, uh, from that behaviour. Um, I'd have to say yes to both of those questions. Um, the formalised process of getting feedback from students, I've done some student voice surveys around specific groups, asking some specific questions but also some more generic questions around their learning experience and compared results before the camera went in and then results towards the end of the year um, to see what their responses are. And there was a marked improvement, particularly around student engagement in lessons, which I think is as a result of that responsive teaching that I've improved on, but also I've done a lot around with itness um, to the point where I completely remodeled my classroom over the summer holidays, and that's had a really, really positive impact as well. And then, yeah, 
Yeah. So in, in terms of the uh, pupil feedback, it, it's quite interesting. When, I'm, when I've done the traditional lesson observations, I think you know, the Hawthorne effect might be more my effect going in and trying to disrupt things for the, for the class because the, the last thing I want to see is, is those children just doing something on performance. So you know, talking to the, to the children and saying, is this what it's always like? You know, do you always do it like this or is this just because I'm in the classroom? You know, and, and, and I think what I get from the camera, and, and I think the key point to remember is this isn't video that I own. You know, this video is, is owned by the teacher and this is video that's being shown to me. So when I'm, I'm saying, well, why did that child roll their eyes at that point? What made that child engage there? And then we can go and ask the child and share the video back with the child and say, what was it in particular that, that you, were, you were able to do? And I think that's really powerful um, to get the children's responses. When the children see themselves, which I know Rachel shared um, with, the, with the class, you know, and they said, oh, I didn't realise I did that. Right. And it's, I think, and it's I think, very makes them very self-aware. I think that's you just hit the nail on the head. I think that's the really key point. You know, um, mine's an inner-city school, very much smack bang in the middle of Aston. Students come from the whole of Birmingham. Now we have cameras in classrooms already. It's an engineering academy. We've always had a camera in the classroom. It's a very poor quality single camera from one point. And those areas where we've got the on-view cameras where the difference is. And we're a restorative practice school. For those who don't know RP, means obviously we work with our students to actually identify their behaviours beforehand. And that's where the really powerful bit comes, because actually they often don't realise they've done it. And having those clear conversations, you know, how did you feel at that time? How did you think that person felt at that time? actually having a look at the footage and realising by you doing that, and often it's the low-level disruption, but by you doing that or moving that or doing that and moving that pen, or do, look at how you impacted on the learning that was around you. That's the really power because it changes behaviours. And more importantly, not only does we're talking here about changing teachers' behaviours, it's the power to change learner behaviours. I think that's the one of the most significant things for me. Hi, I'm Sal McKeon. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, now, you're all really nice people today, <laughs> competent teachers, good with technology. I can see it worked really well. I can see a lot of the advantages, particularly for identifying those passive students, students who are kind of opting out of the class without necessarily being noticed. But at the same time, you started the morning by looking at the dropout of teachers. Mm. Um, one of the major reasons for that, I was just trying to find some stats, but I can't. Um, but one of the major reasons is bullying senior management. And I think many in the room would feel that there is potential here for this to be used as a cosh to remove teachers who are underperforming or whose face doesn't fit. Now, um, I know that in theory, everything is confidential. It is just for the teacher to reflect and improve their practice. But if senior management wants to see your footage, I could see it being a problem for teachers saying no. Now, all of you, as I started by saying, are really <laughs> nice people, but you will all be aware of perhaps in neighbouring schools or notorious schools that there are those bullies out there. Do you think there are ways that safeguards could be built in? I don't mean technological safeguards, but ways that safeguards could be built in so that this does remain a positive tool and not something which is going to undermine teacher confidence even further? Really, really good question, Dan. Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely key. And I think the, the question comes around culture, really, the culture of the school. And if the, the um, cameras are being put in for a culture of observation for um, performance management reasons for you know the the big brother in the room so I can watch you constantly you know I was asked when when I was offering this out to the teachers in in um, Shavington am I going to sit in my office at my desk with my feet up watching what was going on uh, a absolutely not and I think that there's got to be a um, system where the the senior leads in the school actually develop that trust with the with the teachers so I genuinely have never seen any footage that, that the teacher hasn't released to me. Not at all. I can't access it. I haven't got a login. I'm not able to. If, if Rachel said to me, I don't want you to see it, I, I can't do it. There's always going to be that element in the, in the profession of someone who wants it for a different reason. And I think that if there is a, a culture of respect and trust and it's for self-reflection, then, it, then it's going to be very, very powerful. Um, I think that if, if the... Um, motivations are wrong for putting it in it's going to be a real issue um, in in schools but i think the getting the buy-in from teachers is is the way forward to do it thank you david 
Yeah. Um, what I don't know if you've looked at the latest version of the software, but at the, at the bottom of the screen, there's a there's a, essentially a log. Uh, and I know you sort of slightly dismissive of technological um, safeguards, but there are technological safeguards. I'm not the, you, dismissive of them. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. But the but one one of the safeguards in that is uh, I mean we could usernames and passwords can always be worked around in some way, shape, or form. You just permissions and everything else. What one thing that's built into the system which can't be worked around is an audit. So if you owned a piece of video that was shot in your lesson and everything else, anything that happens to that video is reported back to you. So if somebody else, even if you've allowed somebody else to watch it, the fact that they've watched it or the fact they've taken a clip from it will be reported back to you. So you actually have got a, a watch guard in place that at least notifies you of what go, what's going on at a technological level. Th there's also a slightly simplistic point here that Obviously, there's a cost implication of putting in, a piece, in this piece of software, uh, this piece of hardware, and, and the, the software subscription that goes with it, and all the rest of it. The if you've got that box will be sat in a um, in a uh, in a classroom, um, used by a teacher, it will have cost the school money. If the school then starts to use that for what we may consider more nefarious um, reasons, there's very little that a school can do to stop the teacher standing on a chair, putting a piece of tape over the camera and unplugging the microphone, um, at which point you've wasted your investment. So I think if a school is going to go into it with that attitude, they need to go and buy a, a security camera system and not, not, a le not this lesson view system, because this is not designed to be, you know, for, it's not designed for that purpose, and so it wouldn't, it wouldn't withstand somebody absolutely desperate to not have it functioning in their classroom. Thank you, David. Let's move, move across sorry. to Claire. You want to say something briefly? Yeah, um, I, I coach teachers who um, are struggling at various points and um, failed to keep one teacher in the profession because on the time issue, I would observe this teacher for an hour a week and then spend another hour dissecting that and replanning the next lessons. That is massively expensive and, and time consuming. I actually, he, he eventually left the profession. I didn't say much about my coaching, but um, I honestly believe if he could have had a camera to watch himself in private, day in, day out, because he had so much that was right, um, he'd still be teaching. So the cost there, makes the cost of the camera and the equipment look tiny because we've lost him. Really good, really good point. I'm going to go back out to the, uh, the floor now, please. I've got a microphone, please. I can teach it. I can shout it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I come from Wabi. We're a company who are um, working with education in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm interested to when you talked about the camera in a box and you set it up in seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Do you mean the portable one, not the one that goes in the ceiling? No, that was that was a that was a proper installation. In reality, if I was setting it up for, for to, to live in a classroom, I'd take a bit longer. I'd <laughs> plumb the cabling in a bit more nicely and everything else. But fundamentally, it is if you if you've got a network point on your wall and the power socket next to it, you literally plug, 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 chuck the cable up for the camera, plug the camera in. I mean, it's, it, I'm helped by having ceilings like this, nice suspended ceiling. It's a bit more complicated yeah. if you haven't got a suspended ceiling. But the the point I'm making is it's a very it's a very simple install. It's not something like you used to get with the interactive wi uh, whiteboards where you have to get a professional company coming in and putting it on the wall and mounting a projector and powering the roof. It's nothing like that. It's a, it's something that really any I, school IT department should be more than capable of doing. I'll come times. back to you because I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> you're going classrooms around the world, correct? Well, we, we're working in um, what you would call very under-resourced community schools um, at the moment, specifically in Zambia and South Africa. And our um, angle is actually different in that although we would love to think teachers and schools are going to use this for self-reflection at the moment, that is without a doubt a step too far for the schools that we're in. Mm. We're actually more interested in using it to record examples of best practice that we can share with our growing community. So, you know, when we talk about thumbs up, thumbs down in our training, mm. this is what we mean in 10 different classrooms, in 10 different locations, in 10 different settings. So we're really keen on it from that point of view. Um, we've been working with Andrew and John already and um, we're, we've been struggling for all sorts of different factors such as Wi-Fi, yeah. set up a class. Classrooms, all this kind of thing. So for us, we've got very different yeah. hurdles. 
um, but we're looking to, to make it work because we think it's the best way we've got of trying to get the volume of examples for African teachers and African classrooms to see other teachers, of which there's very little footage on the internet. I, absolutely. I'll, I'll just comment on this for one minute from Perth's perspective. I've been very privileged to work in Sierra Leone for six years, work in schools there, and you know, I've watched, watched lessons, biology lessons there, where the teacher has actually talked about and taught of the spleen being in the brain. Um, and you're sat there thinking, okay, this is not just a misconception, this is just wrong, but realising they're teaching from the notes that they made from their teacher, who learnt it from their teacher. So I absolutely understand it, and you're absolutely right, and you've touched upon a fantastic area of development for where it can work. You're absolutely right. There's core things in terms of how you actually create it, but in reality, the simplistic perspective of the computer and the camera and actually sharing that is really, really powerful. Yeah, and for us, we have different challenges, such as um, teachers not understanding how the camera is going to work and that it might come back to bite them, yeah. you know, or yeah. be used in a way they don't understand. We have huge issues with consent, getting yeah. consent from parents, from teachers. This is, it's, it's one thing to sign a piece of paper, it's another thing to understand what that piece, sign that piece of paper means, so yeah. we have to ensure that that's transparent. So lots, lots of hurdles, but we're, I mean, we're very excited about it, but I was just curious about yeah. the setting up thing. Absolutely, I think you've, I'll leave it on that word you finished on, which is absolutely key, I think, which is transparency. Um, any other questions from the room? One more, thank you. Thank you. Um, just interested really in the experience of the teachers. Um, using kind of new solutions like this in, in pedagogy, um, are any surprising things that have popped up in the way um, students have interacted with teachers or have you found new ways to work with the students to give them a kind of better experience? Yeah. Claire, do you want to go first? Yeah. I don't particularly have any behaviour issues, nothing that's major. Um, so you tend to think, well, everything's fine and dandy. And so at one particular lesson, I was only watching it by chance. I hadn't planned to watch that particular lesson. And uh, I modelled whatever it was we were doing, and I used a traffic light system so I can see who, who needs the help. And they were kind of on orange, midly, because we'd only just introduced the topic. So off I went to my low ability table that always needs help and there we go. When I watched it back, and I could look in every corner, and I thought, why aren't they working? That was such a brilliant model I did there. <laughs> why aren't they working? And it was only maybe a minute. That's a long time not to pick your pen up and get on with whatever it was I'd asked them to do. So I looked deeper into it. What had I actually said from their point of view? And I thought, I didn't model that properly. Now, I would not have picked that up. I'd have just gone firefighting all around the room, thinking, there we go, right, we've got it now. We could have got it the first time. If I'd modelled it better, I wouldn't have seen that if I hadn't had the camera in my room. So now I look at things far more <coughs> from their perspective, much, much more from their perspective, because you can see their response or lack of it. I think um, just you're going to come to Dr. Sean in a moment. I think for me, it's one very simple thing, one of the most really exciting things in terms of that teacher behaviours versus learner behaviours. And we're a TEEP school, it's when it's really hammered home. But around the learner behaviours, actually, is what we call and sort of label the grey child. You know, we all know those students then, obviously, watching the footage, those students which are the ones that you're challenging, maybe that low level disruption sometimes. Also, those ones that you're really, really pushing, they're bright, they're asking the questions. For me, the biggest challenge is a school that you know, really does want to continue to strive for that improvement. Actually, our target area is the middle. Those students, that, as you mentioned before, you, you see from that video, don't participate. Or come, they don't do anything wrong, but actually at the same time, they're not making the progress that we would expect from that child. And actually, that's where the, the cameras really come through. Just briefly to Dr. Sean. Yeah. yeah, something that was surprising just last week, um, working with the head of science, he's chosen a particular group um, because he's interested in them. They cause him issues. And we were observing together, doing a co-observation, and they selected 20-minute sections because we know that although we talk for an hour, we haven't got the time to review the entire hour. So we reviewed 20 minutes, and we were going through, and I was plotting away and just describing what I was seeing. So I was creating this, this graph, this flow. Uh, and we was interested in that semi-visible layer, i.e. what the students were doing at the same time. Um, and therefore, we were looking to plot that. And as he was moving the camera around, he spotted something that he had not seen when he was teaching. And that there were three boys that sat at the back, and he described one as you know, very able but lazy, one blah, blah, blah. And he stopped, and he was very quiet, and he said, look at that. He said, look how kind they are to each other. One kid was helping another, not cheating, but getting up, helping him, got his book, got him all sorted out. And the response from that teacher 
and he used that an act of kindness has already changed his attitude towards those individuals in that class because he was so busy delivering the lesson he never spotted that and therefore he only knew of them and now he knew something more Fantastic. so already we've got a change in that really really, really, yeah. really really good answer thank you very much john Housen. um just an observation first we've now got millions of households around the country looking at what's going on in lessons as a result of television producers deciding uh, what they want to um, and i well remember when the, the teach first tough young teachers came screaming at the television within the first five minutes move the furniture <laughs> because it was absolutely clear that this student was set up to fail but my, my question is one can imagine that in real time this is such a rich resource that you have so much potential information on it. How do you program the time into an already busy workload to make sure that you can make use of it? And what's that time resource like in terms of negotiating at the school level to make sure it can be used effectively? Fantastic question. I'll take that as our last question now. And obviously afterwards, we will be all hanging around here. And if you've got after the demonstration, lots of questions, please do uh, pick them up more on. It's a really good question. So Dan, I'm going to come to you, please. Yeah. Um, the way we the way we timetable and program in. So I, I currently um, run three schools. We've got a cohort of NQTs, and this is massively powerful for for NQT. So we're looking to get this this camera in because the time is absolutely critical. Now the schools are all 15 minutes apart, but if they're going to watch 20 minutes of a lesson, and, and you know my NQT mentor, my student mentor's got to travel around those. It's a day to go and see, you know, three 20 minute 20 minute slots really by the time time it's done. So this, this technology gives us the power to actually schedule um, the reflection time. So every fortnight, the NQTs get an opportunity to all get together in a different school in a scheduled CPD slot, slot using PPA time, using their NQT time, to discuss what's gone on in the lessons. So where you were saying about screaming at the, uh, screaming at the TV to say, why aren't you moving the furniture? That going from being a, a following a recipe to being a chef, that responsive, we use a, a phrase called, you know, we, we talk about failing fast. If you know it's not right, why are you keeping on doing it? You know, and, and actually, the, the key to getting this to work is having the, the time to discuss what went wrong, why are you going to do it like that again? So it is about program, it is about giving time, it is about directing some of that non-contact time for teachers. Um, but once that, that discussion is around learning, around the children, around what's actually gone on in the classroom, it's actually worthwhile rather than, you know, Sometimes that PPA time might be sat in a, a, you know, a staff room having a cup of coffee and marking some books. But actually, that, that's valuable time. But this really gets to the heart of what, what we're trying to do as a, um, as a school and get the children learning and learning from each other and building that community of, of learners. I think that's that key point is about that culture and for you know for this working it's working in a school where they value that and you know the work obviously teacher development trust have been doing and we've worked with them around that actually if you don't invest in that training that cpd time actually you're failing as a school anyway can Last i just point, add course, one yeah. thing very quickly i've um, i've now started using it with my colleague in the, in the department and i think ultimately every teacher at the heart of their job they we are still learners and we want to model what learning looks like. And I think if you really want to be the best version of yourself, you will make it a priority. So for me, part of my leadership time is working with Sean weekly. We have that time, um, which is, I'm very fortunate to have that time to be able to do it. But with my colleague, we have actually set aside a proportion of PPA time that we're both willing to invest and we're enjoying it. And it is making getting up in the morning and going to work so much more enjoyable because you know you've got your own learning challenge. And sometimes you walk away and think, oh, really not sure why I thought that would be a good idea. But you learn from it and discuss it and thrash out the ideas and take the risks and walk away feeling like a better teacher. And ultimately, if we feel like we're being better teachers, we're going to deliver better lessons. I think that's a perfect and we've point got to, hold to, uh, to, to hold that, that sentence. That's absolutely right. Can I thank the pa panel here for today? I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Actually, I'm the, I'm the first one to be happy at saying it's not about the camera. You know, I think that's where we came in with Scott this morning. First thing was that, yeah, we're putting cameras in classrooms, but it's about the application and, and what the end results are in investment in teaching and learning. And I think that from, from the colleagues here, from the questions, I think we can say that there are some really positive things happening. So thank you to you for all coming along. Um, 
you are very welcome to tuck into some of the, the food that's going to be available. But also down the end of the room, we've got a, a bit of a classroom set up, so you can come and be a, a naughty pupil in view of the camera if you want. But uh, also talk to my colleagues there on the left, uh, John and Paul, and have a go with the software. So thank you very much for all coming along here today.